Thank you for joining the National Headache Foundation's chat on management of your headache in the emergency department. Today we have with us Dr. Benjamin Friedman, the Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Montefiore Medical Center. Dr. Friedman? Good evening. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you on the topic of headache management in the ER. It's a topic that's near and dear to me. Thanks to the National Headache Foundation for inviting me, and thanks to you for tuning in. My name is Benjamin Friedman. I'm an emergency physician and headache researcher based in the Bronx. As a starting point, we'll briefly discuss the intersection of migraine and emergency medicine. Migraine, as I'm sure you all know, is quite common. One out of three American women suffer with disease, as do 6% of American men. Altogether, nearly 40 million Americans suffer with the debilitating headaches that are the hallmark of this disorder. Given this very large population prevalence, ER use for management of migraine is relatively uncommon. 6% of Americans with migraine visit an ER annually. Of these 6%, most visit the ER infrequently. That is no more than three times a year. 20% of patients who use an ER for management of severe headaches do so four or more times per year. And I'll take the next slide, please. When you go to an emergency room, you will probably see an emergency physician. An emergency physician is someone who has completed residency training in emergency medicine or worked for many years in an emergency room and has been certified by the American Board of Emergency Medicine. Emergency medicine is the med medical specialty devoted to acute illness and trauma with an emphasis on diseases or, or injuries that threaten life and limb or cause severe pain. If you live in a metropolitan area or visit an academic medical center, you are most likely to see an emergency physician in the ER. If you live in a rural setting or go to a community hospital, you might see other types of physicians, such as family practitioners, internists, surgeons, or pediatricians. Besides the attending emergency physician, you may see a doctor in training. Depending on their level of seniority, these physicians are called interns, residents, or fellows. Mid-level providers also commonly work in ERs. These are physician assistants and nurse practitioners. Uh, if you go to an ER, you will certainly see a nurse, and you might also encounter pharmacists, respiratory therapists, and social workers. May I have the next slide, please? So other than migraine, what kind of headaches wind up in the ER? Most patients who use an ER for headache have one of the defined headache disorders, such as episodic tension type headache, migraine, or cluster headache. Other patients have a secondary cause of headache. That is, something else is causing the headache, such as a strep throat, sinusitis, or a bump on the head. Very rarely, something more concerning is causing the headache. Examples of these more concerning processes are meningitis, that is an infection of the brain lining, or a ruptured aneurysm. May I have the next slide, please? To make sure that you don't have one of these bad causes of headache, emergency healthcare providers will first ask you a series of questions about your headache and perform a physical exam. Based on your description of your headache and the findings on your physical exam, the emergency physician will put you into one of these categories. Number one concern for a bad cause of headache. Number two, a known headache disorder such as migraine that simply didn't get better with whatever you usually take. Or number three, a benign new type of headache such as sinusitis which can be treated very readily. May I have the next slide please? If the healthcare provider is concerned about a bad cause of headache, he or she will probably draw some blood tests, do a urine test, and order a CAT scan of the head. He or she may also recommend a procedure called a lumbar puncture, in which spinal fluid is taken with a small needle from your back, similar to an epidural, or perhaps they'll recommend an MRI. Next slide, please. If you have a known headache disorder, such as migraine, cluster, or tension-type headache that just hasn't responded to your usual medication, the emergency physician will usually recommend treatment with an intramuscular or intravenous injection. I've listed some treatments here. For migraine, commonly used agents are sumatriptan, also called Imitrex, DHE or dihydroergotamine, Reglan, also known as metoclopramide, Compazine, known as Prochlorperazine, or Toradol, or Ketorolac. If nothing else works, the emergency doc may be forced to recommend an opioid medication. For cluster headache, oxygen, uh, Imitrex, and corticosteroid medications are commonly used. Non-steroidal medications such as Toradol or Ketorolac are commonly used for tension type headache. Next slide, please. What else causes headache? 
Well, acute sinusitis can cause headache. For more discussion on that, I refer you to the excellent talk by Dr. Martin available on the NHF website. Trauma, either acute or sometime in your past, can also cause headache. And for that, I refer you to the talk by Dr. Katie on the NHF website. It is commonly stated that high blood pressure or hypertension can cause headache. I'm not sure how commonly this happens, and I submit that it's just as likely that the pain of migraine causes blood pressure elevation rather than the high blood, rather than the high blood pressure causing a headache. Localized infections such as ear infection, strep throat, or tooth infection can cause headache. Your emergency healthcare provider will no doubt examine you to make sure you don't have one of those. And finally, bony, ligamentous, or muscular problems such as inflammation or spasm can cause headache. Next slide, please. If your doctor suspects one of these latter causes of headache, you may get the full badness workup, including blood tests or CAT scan of the head, depending on how apparent the cause of headache is. Your emergency healthcare provider will no doubt give you whatever treatment is appropriate, be it antibiotics, decongestants, or sometimes painkillers. Sometimes, despite a full workup, it is not apparent what is causing your headache. In this case, you will probably be given a diagnosis of headache not otherwise specified and discharge on painkillers. Next slide, please. Emergency docs tend to be quite adept at excluding malignant causes of headache. So you, if you have a new scary headache, the ER is a good place to be. For me, scary headaches are any of the following. First, a thunderclap headache. A thunderclap headache is a headache that com comes on like a clap of thunder. You go from no pain to horrible, unbearable pain instantly. Second, a new headache associated with parts of your body not working. So if you have a headache and you're not speaking correctly, you can't move part of your body, or something seems wrong with your vision, the ER is the place to be. And finally, a headache associated with a high fever. Now, if you have a bunch of symptoms with fever, such as runny nose, diarrhea, or body aches, you can probably just call your doctor. But if it's primarily headache and fever, come on down to your emergency room. And also, emergency physicians are quite good at treating acute pain. So if you have a typical migraine, but you're just not getting any relief, and your doctor is not available, then the ER is a reasonable place to go. May I have the next slide, please? What we're not good at is treating chronic illness. So for most of your migraine needs, you need to establish a strong relationship with a competent primary care provider, neurologist, or headache or pain specialist. There's a physician finder function on the National Headache Foundation website. Next slide, please. Now finally, I want to spend a few minutes talking about opioid medications. Opioids are the class of medication used most commonly to treat migraine in U.S. and Canadian ERs. Examples of opioids are morphine, dilaudid, also known as hydromorphone, and demerol, also known as meperidine. These are controlled substances regulated nationally by the Drug Enforcement Agency because they have a high potential for abuse. Next slide, please. The good thing about opioids is that they are very effective painkillers that are very safe that are very safe if used in a monitored setting such as an ER. Next slide, please. The bad things about opioids are the following. First, opioids can worsen your underlying headache disorder. So if you get migraines only a few times a month and you take opioids regularly, you may increase your migraine frequency to a few times per week. Second, opioids can make you refractory to more standard migraine medication. That is, if you use opioid medication, then in the future, you may not be able to be treated with standard migraine medication, such as sumatriptan or imitrex. Third, there's a high potential for abuse of this medication. And fourth, finally, if you're treated with opioids for acute migraine, you are more likely to wind up back in the ER again and again. Next slide, please. That being said, uh, if opioids are the only thing that works for you, I recommend that you establish a strong relationship with a good headache doc be it a primary care provider, a neurologist, or a headache specialist. May I have the next slide, please? Let them help you manage your migraines, and then when you need to go into an ER for opioid medication, that doctor can be an advocate for you. That's now the end of my slide presentation, and I'd now be happy to hear your questions. Our first question comes from Larry. He'd like to know at what point should you go to the ER? There are a few different reasons why patients uh, might feel the need to go to the ER. The first is a new or scary type of headache 
and the other is unbearable pain. There are several types of headache that I think are concerning enough that requires people to go to the emergency room. The first is a type of headache called a thunderclap headache, a headache that within seconds gets unbearably bad. One moment you're fine, and the next minute you're in unbearable pain. If you have a thunderclap headache, you should go to the ER to get, uh, to get a quick workup. The next type of headache that requires workup in the emergency room uh, is if you have a, a headache associated with fever. So if you have a, a bad headache and fever, particularly if your neck feels stiff, there's a concern for meningitis or infection of the lining of the brain. And that's another type of headache that needs to be in the ER. The third scary type of headache is a headache that's associated with parts of your body not working correctly. So if you have a headache uh, and, you, and, you, and you feel like you're not walking correctly, you're walking clumsily, or your speech isn't quite right, or your vision has changed, uh, that's another type of a scary headache that needs to be worked up in the emergency room. So if you have any of the scary headaches, you should go to the emergency room for an expedited workup. The other reason to go to an emergency room is if uh, you're having a fair amount of pain, whatever medications you've taken at home for your headache haven't helped, uh, and your primary care provider is unavailable, that's certainly a good reason to go to the ER so you can get expedited treat-up of your pain. Thank you. Our next question is from Nancy. She says, after going to a pain rehab clinic to learn to manage migraine pain six years ago, she hasn't been back to an ER since. If, for instance, she needed to go while she was on vacation, has the experience changed that lasts over the last decade? Well, I, I've been fortunate enough to never, uh, to never have been a patient in an emergency room. Uh, so, so, so I, you know, I don't have a, a full understanding of the experience of being a patient there. Uh, I can tell you that, that migraine management in the ER has not changed that much, has not changed that substantially over the last 10 years. Uh, for the most part, uh, opioid medications are what are used most commonly in the ER to treat, uh, to treat migraines. Uh, other medications used in the, in the emergency room are, are the triptan, such as sumatriptan or imitrex, and many of the anti-emetic medications, such as reglan or metoclopramide, uh, prochlorperazine or compazine or droperidol. Jessica wanted to know, should she go to the ER for an intractable headache? And if she does go for a long-term headache, what sort of treatment should she expect? Emergency healthcare providers are best at uh, relieving the acute pain of a headache, uh, but they're not so good at managing uh, underlying headache disorders. So if you're somebody who has chronic migraine, that is, you're somebody who's suffering migraine on, let's say, 18 days every single month, the ER is not an ideal place to, to manage your, uh, your migraine because that's not really uh, what emergency physicians do for a living. However, if you have an acute headache that's causing unbearable pain and you can't get relief from whatever medication you have at home uh, and your doctor is unable to prescribe something or is unavailable, then it's reasonable go to go to an emergency room uh, to, to receive uh, treatment for your acute headache to help relieve the pain until you can connect back with your doctor and continue your management for the chronic underlying headache disorder. Our next question comes from Paul. He says he thought that Toradol was no longer available. Is it very bad for your stomach? Uh, so, so Toradol uh, is available. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a shortage for a while. Uh, over the last six months, there have been intermittent uh, shortages of, of Toradol. So, so perhaps that was his, his experience when he went to the emergency room. Toradol uh, does have a bunch of side effects. Uh, most notably, uh, it can damage your stomach. Uh, and it could, it could harm your kidneys. Most of the damage that we see from Ketorolac is from patients who take the medication chronically, that is, uh, every single day and sometimes multiple times a day. It does not seem that one dose of Ketorolac in the emergency room does that much uh, substantial da damage to one's body. Thank you. Barbara says she rarely needs to go to the ER, but when she does go, she's treated as if she's a drug seeker. Do you have any suggestions on managing this? Uh, I, I do. Uh, I think uh, that this is a common problem that, that many patients report, uh, and uh, it's a reflection of uh, 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 the emergency physician's uh, desire to, to try to do uh, the best possible thing for every patient. On the one hand, uh, one would like to relieve the acute pain that headache patients uh, feel. On the other hand, you don't want to somehow administer a medication that's going to harm the underlying headache disorder, make the underlying headache disorder worse, and make the headache go from uh, an intermittent headache to a frequent headache. 
I think if, uh, uh, if opioid medications are the only type of medications uh, that work for, for a, a particular patient, the best thing to do is to establish a relationship with a primary care physician, a neurologist, or a headache or pain specialist, and before going to the ER, call that doctor so they can advocate for you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Melissa. She'd like to know what she should do if an ER doctor won't treat her. Uh, if, if an ER doctor won't treat you, uh, um, I, I guess I would go to a different ER. Uh, I mean, you know, perhaps you can explore the reasons uh, why the uh, emergency doc doesn't want to treat and see if there's some compromise that could be worked out. But, you know, short of that, get, get, a, get a second opinion. Robert states that going to the emergency room is sometimes difficult for headache sufferers. He wants to know if he should bring his medications to prove that he actually has a migraine condition. Uh, I think certainly the more information that you bring when you come, uh, the better. Uh, more information is very useful. Uh, but for patients uh, with, with chronic headache disorders uh, who, who require potent medications when they go to the ER, I think the easiest way to make that experience uh, 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 more bearable is, is to have a good relationship with a primary care physician, some outpatient doctor who sees you regularly, who knows you well, and has a good relationship with you. And that doctor can then call the emergency room doctor and advocate for you. Scott would like to know when IV fluids and IV shots are needed for very bad migraine headaches. Uh, IV fluids uh, and IV shots are needed. Uh, uh, in a few uh, different scenarios. Uh, as many of you know, nausea and vomiting are very common in migraine. Uh, if the nausea and vomiting is so bad that you can't get any water down, you can't get any fluids down, and you can't get any medication down, then, then you, you do in fact need some type of injection uh, to, to treat your migraine and intravenous fluids to, to rehydrate you. Uh, it's generally felt uh, also that uh, um, uh, injectable medications are a bit more potent than oral medications. And so if you're not getting sufficient relief from your oral medications, then that too is a time uh, for injectable medications and IV fluids. Our next question comes from Nicole. After trying a couple of different prescriptions, including Zomig, Excedrin migraine is the only medication that works effectively for me. With that being pulled off the shelf due to manufacturing mishaps, what is the preferred over-the-counter medication that is similar to Excedrin? You know, there's, there's a whole aisle full of, of migraine medication uh, uh, in, in your local pharmacies. Uh, and for different patients, different, different ones of these medications, different medications uh, are effective. Uh, if, uh, if Excedrin uh, is no longer available where you live, uh, I would try a, a, a potent non-steroidal agent. Examples of non are, are ibuprofen, which is known as Motrin or Advil, uh, or naproxen, which is, uh, is often sold as Aleve. Our next question is from Nancy. She says, my doctor prescribes only enough Toradol for one injection every four to six weeks. This way, it, is, it usually helps my over-the-top migraines. But what about taking it orally in pill form? Is it, strong, is it as strong as the injectable? Is it as strong as the injectable is the question. My sense is the injectable uh, is a bit more potent uh, than the oral medication. Uh, but, uh, uh, but the oral medication is, is quite effective in, in the majority of cases, uh, and, and the oral medication is a reasonable alternative if you can only get, uh, uh, if you can't, if you don't have access to an injection. All right. Barbara says, uh, I understand what you're saying about establishing a relationship with the primary care doctor, but if I'm heading to the ER and it's because of the pain is unbearable at the time and I can't reach my doctor, how can I get the best treatment without my doctor as an advocate at that time? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a difficult situation. It sounds like uh, it's something that you've experienced before. Uh, I think uh, most emergency docs uh, are well intended. Uh, they, they chose the field because they have a strong desire to help people with painful conditions. Uh, I think it's reason. Uh, I think a good uh, suggestion would be to bring as much information with you as you can. Uh, um, uh, document your headache history, uh, and uh, and uh, have a dialogue with the uh, the emergency healthcare provider. 
to, to, to work out a solution that's acceptable to everybody. And as I said before, if you're not getting a good answer uh, when you go to one emergency room, you can get a second opinion at another emergency room. Thank you. Lisa has a follow-up to that question. Uh, she'd like to know what are the best steps to take when it's after hours and you're not able to get a hold of your doctor? Uh, a lot of doctors uh, have uh, have somebody covering, there's somebody on call for the group. Uh, uh, that being said, I understand that's not, uh, that's not universal and there are many practice uh, 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 settings where there is nobody on call. If you have unbearable pain in the middle of the night and nobody's uh, around, then, then you need to go to an emergency room. Uh, and hopefully uh, what you'll find there is a, a professional, compassionate uh, emergency healthcare provider who will help you with your headache. Thank you. Is there a best practice tracking method to determine triggers? Oh, uh, you know, I, I don't know that there's one universal solution uh, for, for every person. Uh, for, for some people, I'm sure uh, a paper uh, diary uh, would work well. Uh, 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 other people can use uh, online tools that are available. There are various online uh, um, uh, diaries and logs that, that, that uh, people can use uh, to to help track their, their migraine triggers. Uh, we have one instance here with Melissa. She says her headache specialist is in another state, um, so it's a little difficult to get help for her extreme migraines in the ER when she does go. Do you have any alternatives for that? I think having a, a, a local primary care provider who can coordinate with the, the headache specialist uh, might might be good for Melissa. Uh, it's good to have a local doctor that uh, that you can and, that you can call and have a good relationship with. Uh, hopefully, that doctor is somebody who has an understanding of headache management uh, and and can help uh, either make calls for you or or treat the the extreme headaches himself. Our next question comes from Paul. Are ER docs trained in newer medications for migraines, such as Topamax? Uh, so uh, um, emergency physicians, as just about all physicians, uh, uh, attend professional conferences, uh, usually on a yearly basis, and, and read the literature. Uh, and uh, as with all professionals, uh, you know, some are better at keeping up and some, some are not quite as good at keeping up. Uh, I, I think as a patient, uh, you have a right to expect that your emergency health care provider is up to date uh, on all current treatments of migraine. Uh, with regard uh, to, to, uh, to, it was to Topamax was the question, I believe, right? with regard to preventive medications, emergency physicians are not so good at treating chronic uh, illnesses. Uh, and if you, uh, if you require a prescription uh, for a migraine preventive, I think then your primary care provider, your neurologist, or your headache specialist is a better bet. All right. It looks like we're uh, still waiting on a few questions to come through, Dr. Friedman. So you could, if you'd like, uh, give us a short uh, lecture on a couple of things. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, one, you know, one issue that, that seems to have come up uh, a, a bit uh, in the questioning uh, uh, is, is, I think, a reflection of, of the difficult experience that many patients with chronic migraine have when they go to the emergency room and they don't have a sympathetic uh, health care provider there. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation. Uh, the, the migraine patient is in a fair amount of pain. They have photophobia, so the lights are, are bothering them. They might be nauseated. Uh, all they want uh, is relief from their headache, and there they are in a crowded, noisy, and smelly emergency room with a healthcare provider who's not necessarily sympathetic uh, to their needs. Uh, I, I think in that situation, working on some compromise with the healthcare provider uh, might be a reasonable approach. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, emergency healthcare providers uh, are often reluctant to prescribe opioids because they have a concern about worsening the underlying migraine disorder. That being said, if that's the only medication that works for you, obviously you need to get the opioid medication. Uh, I think uh, compromising with the healthcare provider and being willing to try what other medications uh, they want to prescribe before the opioid medication might be uh, a reasonable path to pursue. Thank you. Our next question comes from Paul. He says the ER is really, really expensive. and he would like to hear your thoughts about urgent care versus ER. 
Uh, I think uh, for many people, uh, urgent cares are, are a very reasonable alternative. Uh, for the most part, urgent cares are well set up to give intramuscular or intravenous injections. Uh, I think there might be a fair amount of, of differences in quality from one urgent care to the other. But if you have an urgent care in your neighborhood uh, that, has, uh, that you've heard good things about or that served you well in the past, I think it's very reasonable to go there for headache care. Thank you. Our next question is from Jessica. Jessica suffers from hemiplegic migraine and therefore she can't take DHE or triptans. Is there a certain medication or medication cocktail that she can request in the ER? She states that in the past, some of the ERs has, have called her headache specialist for recommendations, but that's a rare case. Uh, in, in her case, I would use a medication from the anti-emetic class of medication. Uh, these, uh, these, there's a variety of medications in this class. Uh, in this class, uh, it was a class of medication that was uh, initially developed to treat nausea, uh, but in the last few decades, we've discovered that these medications are excellent migraine medications too. Examples of these medications are Reglan or metoclopramide, prochlorperazine or compazine, or a third one called droperidol. All right. Our next question comes from Karen. She states that she had to visit the ER just last Friday. They gave her Toradol, Benadryl, and Regalan. She says she'd like to know how Benadryl helps. So this is a common cocktail of medications. It's three different medications that are commonly used in the emergency room together to treat uh, acute migraine. The Toradol, as we've discussed, uh, is, is, is an anti-inflammatory medication. The Reglan is, is uh, from a class of medications called the anti-emetics. Uh, the Benadryl, uh, uh, Benadryl is commonly administered, but we don't yet have a great sense of, of, of how it works. Uh, it's an antihistamine medication, um, and it's possible that through this antihistamine me uh, uh, mechanism, uh, it's helping migraines. Although to take a step back, if I could, to be honest, we actually don't even know that Benadryl uh, is an effective migraine medication, and sometimes the reasons why uh, it's the reason why it's administered in conjunction with Reglan is to decrease uh, some of the side effects that people get from Reglan. Uh, Reglan, uh, a prominent side effect of Reglan is uh, is restlessness, a sense that you just need to move your body, uh, and Benadryl can help uh, can help mute that, uh, that that side effect. The question of whether Benadryl has primary anti-migraine efficacy is still uh, still unresolved. It's a question that still needs to be explored. I could uh, take this opportunity to, to maybe uh, give a few more suggestions to Jessica, who had the hemiplegic migraine and wanted to know what else uh, could be given. Uh, magnesium is another uh, medication that's sometimes used to treat uh, particularly migraine with aura. It's actually, magnesium is, a, is a, an effective medication for pregnant patients with, with migraine as well. As well. Uh, and then there's the, 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 the whole class of corticosteroid medications, which are also fairly commonly used for migraine. Uh, corticosteroids might take a bit longer to act, but they're very effective at, uh, at uh, preventing the migraine from occurring once it's been gotten under control. Something else that we're seeing uh, of late in the last few years as has come to, to much more attention is, is nerve blocks. Uh, some physicians are trying occipital nerve blocks uh, um, to, to help out people with acute migraine. The way an occipital nerve block would work uh, is your healthcare provider would take a very small needle uh, and give you a little injection in the back of your scalp. Uh, and uh, the medications in that injection, a local anesthetic and a corticosteroid medication, can also be quite effective at relieving acute headaches. Thank you. Mike would like to know um, what your suggestions are as far as if you are looked at as a drug seeker, or do you think you would be taken more seriously as a sufferer if you have a friend or relative with you that can... Um, verify that you do have a condition? Uh, I think in general the answer to that question is yes. Uh, the, more, uh, 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 the more people you have to advocate for you, uh, uh, the better. Uh, although I recommend uh, you bring someone who's uh, uh, mild-mannered, uh, let's say, might be the best type of companions to bring uh, with you to the emergency room. Thank you. Our next question is from Barbara. Propofol infusions have been shown to be effective for aborting migraine, but need to be administered by an anesthesiologist, if I remember correctly. 
do you think propofol may be used in an ER setting more frequently in the future? Uh, I, I, I don't, uh, let, me, let me say it like this. I, as far as I'm concerned, propofol has not yet been shown to be as good as many other migraine medications that are, uh, that are easier to administer. Uh, I think in the future, uh, there's a chance that propofol might be shown to be an excellent migraine medication, but I have not yet seen compelling data to suggest that that's true. And as you mentioned, because of the intensive monitoring needs that are required for every patient who gives propofol, I don't see it becoming a first-line migraine medication anytime soon. Thank you. Our next question is from Nicole. When you have a migraine followed by a lingering or residual headache that lasts for days, what is the normal amount of time for that to go on versus the point where you should contact your doctor again? So by, by definition, uh, migraines uh, last up to 72 hours. That's a typical course for a migraine. Uh, classically, they last anywhere between 4 hours and 72 hours. Uh, sometimes we see migraines lingering uh, beyond that, days, sometimes even weeks. Uh, I, I think uh, if uh, you've tried whatever medication your doctor has prescribed and you haven't uh, had sufficient relief uh, to be able to get back to your usual activities, you should call your doctor right away. I, I would certainly, uh, you know, if you're continuing to suffer, I, I would give it no more than a day or two. Karen states that she once had an ER doctor uh, that wanted her to get a contract. Would that help if you came in? with information that stated you had a chronic condition that was like a contract from your primary care physician or headache specialist? Uh, so uh, contracts uh, between a patient uh, and a healthcare provider are a good way to establish uh, uh, goals and needs uh, so that everybody is clear about what's expected from all parties. Uh, I think uh, if your healthcare provider has established uh, uh, a, a medical contract with you, establish uh, a contract for, for uh, to receive medication. Uh, I think uh, I think it's uh, it, it it would be helpful to bring it along with a letter of introduction from your primary care physician or, or whoever established the contract with you uh, to you know to explain the necessity and to explain everybody's goals and expectations. Our next question is from Mr. Johnson. He says he's aware of using magnesium in a vitamin quantity. How much are you suggesting in an ER setting? Uh, a standard dose in the emergency room is, is 2 grams of magnesium, although uh, the dose finding studies have not yet been done. So nobody's done studies comparing 1 gram of magnesium to 2 grams of magnesium to 3 grams of magnesium. So what the optimal dose, at, uh, what the optimal dose is is not yet known. That being said, 2 grams is a reasonable place to start. All right, Dr. Friedman, until we get more questions um, coming through from the moderator, I can turn it back over to you. Uh, I wish I had more to say to, to the chronic migraine patients who, who have uh, a difficult, uh, who have a difficult experience in the ER. Uh, the issue of, of medication contracts has come up. That's a contract between the patient and the healthcare provider so that everybody's clear uh, as to what uh, the goals and expectations of, of treatment are. I think that's something that other people might seek to explore uh, with the emergency physician uh, in conjunction uh, with your primary care provider and your neurologist or headache specialist. Uh, having a written document uh, so everybody understands what expectations of treatment are and how best to go about uh, treating migraine headaches uh, is a very good place to start and it might help pave the way for a better emergency room experience. Well, Dr. Friedman, we'd like to thank you for joining us and I'd like to thank all the participants. I hope that you received all of the information that you need. Um, and I'd like to remind you that we do have our next podcast August 7th and that will be with Dr. Uh, George Nissan on new daily persistent headaches. Sorry. Once again, thank you, Dr. Friedman, for joining us. You have a great evening. Thanks, you too. Thanks to everybody for tuning in.